All right, ladies and gentlemen, you're listening to the We Be Free radio show, Brain Food from the Heartland. You've heard me talking about this incredible book, The Island of the Four Bs, a modern fable about preparing for your future. I have the author, Ed Hagem, on with me this morning. Ed, good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Lou. How are you? I am well. I'm thrilled that I've got you on. This book is incredible. Your your story, if you will, is incredible. So introduce yourself and tell us about you, Ed. I know we could spend hours. No, no, well, I'm, I'm, my name is Ed Hageman. I'm the luckiest person in the world. And I'm here to prove that anything is possible and the American dream is alive and well. And uh, I've created a fe- fable. Uh, and I think fable is kind of interesting. We can talk about why, if you'd like. But I've created this book basically to try to help almost everybody, the young and the old, in any period of transition, mainly these 18 to 25 year olds when I'm making very key decisions. I'm trying to give them a vocabulary that they can use to find their own answers. This book is not a book to tell you what's right or wrong. This is a book basically asking you the questions that will help you make good life decisions. But I'm a lucky guy. I've, I've, I've really been lucky enough to have it all. I mean, I have a, a wonderful family. Uh, three children, eight grandchildren. I've had a fairly successful business career. I had as a chairman of the board of the University of Rochester, which was a great Masonary experience. I even started a golf course, and it's been very successful. So I must say uh, I, I've been very lucky, and and I basically dedicated the book to my family, the University of Rochester, Harvard Business School, and then last but not least, the United States of America. Yeah, I love that. I love that dedication when you when you said that and how lovely you talk about wife and family. Actually, that's a couple of points that I wanted to make. Uh, talk just a little bit more about them, but your background. I mean, to get to where you are today with your background, go way back and tell us if you would. Well, you know, it 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 it's a story that almost sounds like fiction. Uh, Dad lost all his money in 1929. By 33, he was completely broke. As he told me, he said, I was going to commit suicide or drive across country to California where the streets were paved with gold. He chose the second option. Lucky for me, I wouldn't be here. On the way over, he stopped at a distant cousin's home. In two weeks, he married the, the fourth of his children, five children. She was 15 years younger than he was. And I proceeded to California. The streets weren't paved with gold. But three years later, I was born. I was born to an unemployed father and a homemaker mother. That was on my birth certificate. Dad had trouble keeping a job. He had the demons for losing all his money, but he's also a, a difficult character, which is described in the book. He had a background of, of treating you know, his wife like uh, a servant, like a person who basically he was in charge of and had strict eating habits and so forth. Anyway, they got divorced when I was three years old. She got custody, moved me from Los Angeles back to St. Louis to her parents. My father got visiting rights and five bucks a week of alimony and child support. Anyway, so he got came, he drove 1800 miles, about four or five day trip from Los Angeles to St. Louis, got there on Sunday, took me out for visiting rights. Instead of, you know, taking me to the park at a lunch, kidnapped me essentially, took me back to Los Angeles, told my mother not to look for me, actually threatened her and told me subsequently that she died. For the next 15 years, we started with hotels and motels because my father was a a radio operator aboard a merchant ship. And so I either spent some time in a hotel with him or with friends of his while he was at sea. That all ended when World War II started and uh, he had to go to sea full time as a naval officer, uh, merchant marine officer aboard a ship. I spent the next five years in five Catholic foster homes. Uh, some, the first one was kind of a, almost Dickinsonian with, you know, cold and, and, and abusive. The last one was warm and caring, so I had the whole route. Uh, if the war ended, Dad called for me. I flew across country by myself at age 10, uh, five stopper, you know, with a DC-10. Arrived in New York, stayed at the YMCA and 34th Street with clientele that weren't too super. Then a hotel room in Coney Island for a year, which wasn't a bad year for me, but Dad had uh, trouble getting land-based work and had to go back to sea. In fact, the summer of 1947, I was supposed to live with a neighbor while he was away at sea. And he, at the last minute, the neighbor changed her mind. And I ended up spending part of the summer by myself in a hotel room at 11 years old. He paid for food at the local delicatessen. It's a story that I don't, I don't even believe, but I have documentation. Anyway, she, the neighbor, the neighbor lady was supposed to take me in September, and she decided she wouldn't do it. And from the sea, he found an orphanage for me 
and I spent the next four years in that orphanage. And when I was aging, and I did pretty well, orphanage where I had to trade my room in the hotel and my own bathroom for a room with 50 people, 50 guys in it, and a bathroom with 10 toilets and 10 showers and 10 sinks. But the, the orphanage gave me consistency and community, and I did well at the local school. But when I was 14 years old, they, I aged out of this particular orphanage, and uh, you know my dad totally disappeared, and I became a ward of the state. And luckily, for the one some wonderful social worker, basically put me in another orphanage up in Yonkers, New York, near a very good high school. And I got an epiphany, which was I can get out of this by going to college, actually going to a private college, which was crazy at the time. 1954, poor kids didn't go to private colleges. But I made it in my mind I was going to do it. And luckily, at the end of that, my senior year, I got the NRTC scholarship and applied and got into the University of Rochester. I wanted to go to Cornell, but Cornell required five five years and the NRTC scholarship only paid for four. So, you know, you could say I had possibly every disadvantage that a child could have. You know, basically nobody came to any of my graduations, grammar school, high school, college, or, or, or graduate school eventually. But on the other hand, that experience gave me disadvantages to become advantages. Think of it. If you're in 15 or 20 places before you're 18 years old, you become very adaptable. And I was adaptable. I was also resilient. Resilient is like a muscle. When you, you're using it, it gets stronger. I got quite a bit of self-confidence having gone through crazy, crazy experiences. I also got perseverance. Then you know, I got some anger too, which was not good. You go through that kind of experience. You, you have anger because you're always looking around and say, why me? But I was able, after a short period of time, I was angry for a period of time to direct that anger to making myself, you know, more more productive, more efficient. That's a long. It's a long story. It's, it's a, you know, a it's number an of years. Incredible but story. That, that, that's that's it's a it's an American story. And uh, you know, having been in, in foster homes and orphanages, it it wasn't pleasant. And getting to college was very difficult because when I arrived at college in my black leather jacket with the wrong kind of clothes and everything, the first thing that happened was that. I got rejected by all the fraternities the first year because I didn't fit the fit the mold at all. And, you know, I, I then buried my background. I didn't tell anybody that I'd ever been in an orphanage or a foster home. I was a mysterious kid whose father lived in a post office box in San Francisco and whose mother died when she was three. And I buried the story that I told in this book for nearly 60 years. And then finally, they, my, my wife and family forced it out of me. And I've got the the link up also to the uh, New York Post article, and of course that book, uh, the Rough Less Traveled. Uh, that's uh, incredible. It's it's just an amazing story, and how you focus on positivity and not wallow in why me that why me. The big secret in the book, other than anything is possible and education is a solution. Second one is never be a victim if you can help it. Use the energy for being a victim to figure out what's next. Because you can be, you could hate people, hate situations, blame people. Does you no good at all. You'll see in my life, when it's my fault, I went, what's next? When it wasn't my fault, I also did what's next. So I fight to use the energy in a situation to look at what's next, not be a victim. And I, I sell that to people because that's what happens. They get stuck, you know, hating people. And I could have fought in a couple of situations, and, but it wouldn't have done any good. Go on. And then. Of course, I, I believe in flow, too. There's a reason for everything. When something happens, find out what's next. That's uh, Again, that's incredible uh, philosophy, life philosophy that you have. There's so many. I wonder sometimes what the point is where someone like yourself says, "This is I'm using this and my experience in a positive way, and others make a choice. You made a choice, correct? Right. I mean, you make a choice. You do make a choice. The next morning after a difficult situation, you decide where you're going to place your energy. And there's just no two ways about it that, that, that you place it on what and what's next. Not easy either. But, you know, I, I find that's a much more positive thing than, than you know taking someone on who's done you wrong or where you've made a mistake and you keep beating yourself up and does no good in both cases. So that's another one of my messages. And these messages, I'm just hoping as people read my books, they pick up one or two of these things that really help them on their trip. Wow. I just uh, absolutely, absolutely amazing. And may I say your age to my audience? No, why not? <laughs> You're 86? 
86, yeah. I mean, now I'm 86 and a half. I know, like the five-year-old kid says, I'm five and a half. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. I got to get credit for the whole the whole trip. <laughs> yeah. I mean, actually, I'll be 87 in July. So, you know, it's it's, a, it's scary. I mean, but, you know, it's just a number. And, and like what uh, Clint Eastwood said, don't let the old man in. And I'm trying that. So. Obviously, you're doing a tremendous job. <laughs> Obviously, age of you're doing a fantastic job. It just blows me away. Let's talk about the island of the four Ps. And you do write it as a fable. And you were saying earlier, why as a fable? And again, I love it. What made the? How did you make that it, decision? You know, I, I I I I love the book Who Moved My Cheese. And I said to myself, what's in that book that I love it so much? It's universal. If you look back in history. I did great ideas have been have been basically communicated with fables. You know, go back and you know, today, Al, the alchemist, Dr. Seuss, the Gulliver's Travels, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, Don Quixote. And I think people will accept it. That they're, when you convey an idea with a fable, it's more memorable. And it's not so, as one woman said, who wrote a, a review of a wonderful review, she says, it's not preachy. When you preach something to people, they don't accept it. By the way, this book is, is basically one that says we're telling you how, what decisions you have to make and how you how you can possibly make them. But you have to make them. What's nice about it is the old man in the, in the book basically is not a teacher. He's a guide. He's guiding the young man and later on the young woman how to make their own decisions on these various as aspects. But the fable to me is and it's also fun. I mean, there's so many you know self-help books which are not fun. I've read them all. Not fun. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and I thought this was this was. And we got off on the fable situation, and and you know it, it kind of clicked in pretty well. And I in in a fable you can create characters too, which you know are fictional, but they convey the idea you're trying to convey. Like like the woman in the age of, in the, in, in the village of, of plans. She's a tall. She she exudes plans, you know. And then you know each person. And then the, you can talk about being on a boat you know, characters that do different things, which means creates the concept of partnership and so on. So I think it's kind of fun. And I think people will have fun. It's an easy read. It's only about two and a half hours. And so I think people get through it very quickly, but I want them to read it again. Because if you read Gulliver's Travels or Dr. Seuss or any of these books, you got to read it right through. It's fun. Read about it. And then you got to go through and look beyond and underneath the, the conversation. And I think that's what I'm hoping people will do. Yeah. And again, you can read it by chapter. However, for me, I didn't read it all the way through initially. Yeah, I wanted to kind of go go slow and absorb what I from the book because there's so much. There's so much. Yeah, you can certainly sit down in a few hours and, and read it. I'd like, you know, and people do it different ways. Read through it and then go back, like you're saying. Again, the dedication, wonderful about your family. I uh, you write about your your wife and in, in the in the acknowledgments of your family. Again, I'm gonna repeat what you said earlier to the United States of America for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to realize my dreams. Too often these days, I'm not going to get political. That's not, it's, that's not said enough. I'll just oh, leave I, 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 it like I, I, that. <laughs> this, is, this is the greatest country in the history of the world. We've done more for minorities and for, you know, uh, you know people that are poor. I mean, in other countries, you, you couldn't do what I did during my lifetime most countries in fact as you might have gone down the other way no th this country has done a great it, there's still more to do i mean i i'm not sure it's, we're perfect. it's a yeah but, yeah but this is a country where you know if you really want to work and you you, you have a little gotta have a little bit of luck i mean there's no two ways about it i have if you go through my life i've, I've had some luck and you know and that that's important and but you know I, I think this is the if you look at any other country there is no country that has been as fair to people as we have. And unfortunately, things have been so good for so long, people don't realize it, I guess. But if you go to any other country, it's it's much more difficult. And I've, I've traveled the world. And that's that's an important message for people yeah. to hear, because too often these days, we're hearing different messages and not, and like you said, you, you get used to it. You People, yeah. and it's not this way everywhere. No, it isn't. People get accustomed. They, you know, you're used to it. You're used to yeah, I'll, I'll tell you something very quickly. Um, I moved to Atlanta when I was, oh God, I don't know, 18, 19, hitchhiked down. And I remember 
I saw something. I I got a flat, a uh, an efficiency apartment, and I saw something there that I had never seen before: the back wall, inside wall of a refrigerator. It's like <laughs> home. It's just there was food in it. You know, yeah. I know this might sound a little bit dumb, but it's like, oh, the back wall. There's all you know. You take things raised where there's food at home and et cetera, and it's different. Again, not comparing anything. It's just we no, take right. so much for granted. We take so much for granted. That's right. We do. No, we do. It's it. it if you think people, that these are these are the best of times. I mean, I in, in the '40s and '50s, things were tough. I mean, mm -hmm. they really were tough after the war and so forth. And, you know, I, I look about because the 30s, forget about it. I mean, that was a, a disaster completely in the country. And if you were in Germany in the 20s, I mean, it was just awful also. So, you know, and we, we just have lived through a very great period. I, and I, I, I'm glad that I, I guess one, one of the reasons I'm lucky is I was born at the right time because my most most important part of my life was done was the 80s, 90s and the, two, the 2000s, which have been a very fine period. I mean, little numbers like the stock market in 1983, Dow Jones was 600. It's 30,000 today. I mean, just think of that thing. Real estate that, that you bought back there and so forth has gone up many, many fold. So things have been very good. You know, you know, obviously, we've had inflation, but compensation has gone up for almost everybody. And although, you know, the, the spread between rich and poor is still too wide, the poor has come up quite a bit as well. And even the poor are taken care of as well. We, you know, to some extent. We still have work to do. Sure. I don't want to get political because this is one no, thing I, in this book. What I want to spend time on is my eight words. That's you know, right. My eight yeah. words is I don't want to get self, to, family, work, and community. Community is my word for giving back. And the four P's, passions, principles, partners, and plans. And I want people to focus on those eight words. And that, that, that's what my message, my graduation, by the way, this came out of a graduation speech. I was the chairman of the board and I gave 80 graduation speeches. So I had to have some kind of a, a theme that, would, that I could go back to on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am speaking with Ed Hagem, author of the new book just a few weeks ago uh, available, The Island of the Four Peas, A Modern Fable About Preparing for Your Future. Uh, Ed's website is edhagem.com. Com. And we've got all of those links up. It was interesting when I was reading in the introduction, uh, many jobs that American workers will perform in the 2030s haven't been invented yet. And I thought, wow, you know, I hadn't thought about that with how the advances in, in inventions and how quickly things are changing. Tell us a little bit more about that, if you would. Well, that, if, no, look, look, this, this, you know, this, this, this cell phone thing wasn't around 20 years ago, you know, and now they're talking about, you know, you know, yeah. I talked to God the other day, he's working on a plan to, to get away, do away with pass, passwords. I mean, you know, but, and, and all the transitions, I mean, think about music. When we were kids, big black records, you know, yeah. then the discs. I'll have and some. Now my wife has, a, she puts it on her phone and we've got music and so yeah. forth. So it's the amazing. transitions, also in the healthcare area, for example, we're going to have to cure Alzheimer's. There's no two ways about it. The projections are, you know, 35 million people with dementia in 2050. If we don't stop, you have to think about 35 million care workers. I mean, it just can't be done. So we will solve that. We're in the process of solving, you know, helping climate change. We're solving the, re the reduction of fossil fuels. And I believe fossil fuels will be here for another 50 years, but we'll reduce them to some extent. There's so many things today. AI and robotics will change the world. Digitization is changing the world more than AI and, 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 and robotics. So just take any area of the, of the system and you just project it forward. It's actually moving almost too fast. I'm, I'm a proponent of, of trying to understand technology's effects on society. In fact, along with these effects, the requirements, the sociological requirements of the changes in technology provide many new jobs for people. So I think that's very important. Plus, I hope the international situation gets a little bit better. For the oh. first time in history, we truly have a, an international, in mean, the last 40 years have been a truly international experience, globalization. I think we're going to go through a little deglobalization, which may not hurt us. I hope that it stays globalized because in that respect, when you're a young person and you're getting into a business, the whole world is open to you. But there's so many jobs that are brand new. And that's why I've been involved in an engineering school at the University of Rochester. I think applied science is one of the things we have to spend a lot of time on, you know, taking science that we have and make it making it make the world a better place.
But there, I mean, almost any industry you look at today, the changes are very significant. I mean, my son is a, and he's a, 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 an architect and a real estate person and so forth. And in the old days, you know, brokers had your house and that was it. Now you punch a button and all the houses in this particular town are shown on a screen. You can do what you want. These are changes that are huge. And of course, I believe education is going to go through a massive change as well with technology. So, you know, I, I agree that uh, I think you'll agree. And that's why I want people in the plans chapter. I take young people and I put them into a, a tunnel and they look at history to see how things are changing and what drives things as well. As well. Ed Hagen, one of the things that you, you said about education, and it's something that I've, I talk an awful lot about on the show and have a number of guests on, I get concerned with reading, et cetera, when you, you read about how few kids are in certain areas, in certain areas are proficient in reading, uh, even when they graduate. And that's disturbing to me, the thought of people being unable to read. Where do you do? And I know technology with things, there's probably ways, I dare say, I don't want to say around it, ways to manage, yet I get concerned about that. And you said some talking about uh, technology and education. What can you tell us? We get, we, I, I think the tech, education is going to go through another stage of, of change. Uh, and I, But I, I must say that the, the basics are still so important. You know, reading, writing, and, and math just have to be done. And I can use examples of this in my life. I mean, I graduated as an engineer. And in my senior year, all my work was done on something called a slide rule. Yeah. Three years later, after getting out of the Navy, slide rule wasn't even used anymore. There was something called a computer. And if I didn't come up to speed with, that, with the computer, I'd have been out of business. And when I graduated business school, there's no such thing as an internet. And now the internet is everything. So I, 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 I but what you talked about is, is something that I can't cope with. I do believe that's a problem. I've spent my energies, and I think one has to, in their, in their philosophical, in their, their, in the, in their <clears throat> philanthropic efforts, my focus has been on the sort of 16, 17 year old through 25 to make sure that if that person gets to that point the way I did, that they financially and they emotionally can get to the next step. Back down what you're talking about is an enormously important problem. And I, 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 I've made some small contribution in that area. But we really have to teach people the importance of reading and reading. And I'm not sure technology can help that. What can help that is basically, you know, putting in front of kids. And, I'm, and there's some new books out where there's more pictures than writing to start off with. And the kids get involved in that. And then they go on to reading. There's there's some changes going on there. But it's an area I'm really not that familiar with. But I'm, I think you're absolutely sure. right. It's one of the most important things. And there are a lot of very good people working on that. But it's still way behind. And we have lost... United States has lost a little bit of its lead in that arena, that arena. And, you know, the, the public schools just aren't as good as they used to be. I mean, first of all, I mean, I, I shouldn't say this out loud, I suppose, and I'll get myself in trouble. But when, when, when my wife graduated from college, she had very few choices. So she became a teacher. And now, you know, people have many more choices than being a teacher so that you don't get as many as the good people in, in teaching as we should have. And, and I think that's one because they don't get paid as much and it's a difficult job and so forth. So that could be revamped and that's being revamped. The charter schools are making some big advances there. So I, I'm, I'm optimistic even there. And, you know, I have eight grandchildren and they, they vary all over the place. You know, one guy didn't read until he was about 10 or 11 years old. Now he's an absolute avid reader. So, you know, this particular school said, don't worry about it. They, they move a different direction. So I think there's some, some, some science going on there, but I'm not as familiar with that as I am of this transition where you get through this real problem and you're 17 years old and you basically yeah. have, you know, you're, you're getting, you're taking, you're getting advantages because of your disadvantages. You know, you're a foster kid or an orphan. I want to take that kid to the next step because that's where, well, that's who I was. That's beautiful. You, when you write in the book, and I certainly highly recommend the book, The Island of the Four Ps. And I'm going to say, regardless of where you are in your life, I'm in my, I know it, Pales uh, age wise, but I'm in my 70th year. <laughs> and, and, and six. But it was just, it's like, wow, yeah. I, 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 and I absolutely love this for any age, the island of the four Ps, a modern fable about preparing for your future. The quest begins, and I love this. And by the illustrations are, are great also. Uh, the young man's name Marcus. It was, it was with my name to Plume. I think it was, I'm trying to communicate this very subtly. 
that one is choosing markets as a young person. You're choosing markets to go into. You're going to be you know, like you do. You're going into the communication business. And so he's marketers. And it was, it was my name to plume when I was a strategist on Wall Street. And so I sort yeah. of carried it forward. But it, it okay. sort of, he's, he is seeking markets. And he's seeking markets. He's finding places that he wants to go and things he wants to do. And so it was a name that I, I thought, like Spartacus, you know, it's a, it has a sort of, you know, Greek yeah. ring to it. So yeah. Yeah. You know, again, it's a fable. So I want to make it something a little mysterious. The same thing with our little device in there called a test of mark, you know, which is really in the person's mind. It's just a collection a place where you can collect ideas. So I've got to ask you in writing the book, was there a, the build up to making the decision to write the book? Oh. Well, this took me seven years. <laughs> I had four ghostwriters. Not- no, no, it's, 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 you no know, writing. First of all, when you write things down and you say, oh, this is what I want to say. Then you got to say, are people who are reading it, are you conveying the fact that you want to convey? Con- convey? That's very hard. And then it's got to be readable. So it's a really difficult experience. And I was an engineer, so I was not a great writer. So I, but I, I, I rewrote most of the book myself a number of times, but it took a long time because I wanted to be, get those nuances in each one of those conversations. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant, Ed. Thank you, thank you. The, the decision to want to write the book, you just had to get this out you, because of the humanity in your heart or you wanted to Oh, no, I had a lot of pressure from my wife and my family because they, they only knew part of the story. And then co- combine that with my, my graduation speeches at the University of Rochester, they kind of fit, the, they fit together. I, my story, and by the way, it, I, the four P's I used during my life, I always sought to find out my passions. I set, I basically set the rules, my principles, the rules I was going to follow, the lines I wouldn't cross. You know, I, I basically believe partners or something that, you know, I was always only as good as the people I surrounded myself with. And then finally, my plans, you know, you have to write plans because as you come to a turn in the road, if you don't have a plan, the turn in the road will be the end of the road. If you have a plan, you can make that turn. So I use this. And, and therefore, and again, my passion changed. I, you know, if you read in my book about just enough, I made it just enough money. I had just enough fame. I had just enough everything. But now I've got a new passion. My passion is to communicate these ideas. And as I look through history, and you're 70, you're starting to get to a point in your life where there's certain things you want to do and other things you can't do any longer. I can't run a company. I love run, running companies. But you've got to be there at 6 o'clock in the morning, 6 o'clock and 7 o'clock at night. I can't do that anymore. So this is something that I can do and possibly change people's, a few people's lives. I mean, first of all, you know, I started out doing this, you know, the road on the road, less travel. And I got such good feedback on my life. A woman called me and said, my daughter just read my book. She wasn't going to go to college. Now she's going to college. And I just got a note from her. She's a freshman at Notre Dame. That pays for everything I've ever done on writing and so forth. But the writing is hard. It really is hard because you really want to do a good job and it's not easy. And you don't want to be superfluous at all in your writing. So, uh, but this was something that sort of came together. And it is, you know, I was 70 some odd years old and it was time to sort of do something like this. I had to transfer from being a, a you know, a Wall Street person and also, a, you know, a, a chairman of the board of trustees. What was the next? What was next? And this seems like what's, ne- really, what's next for me. And it's been fun so far meeting people like you. Come on. Thank I, you. <laughs> see, I, I changed one of my principles. My principles on Wall Street was, to live happy is to live hidden. Stay out of the press. Don't talk to people like you. Don't read. Don't go in the newspaper. Concentrate on running the company. I and mean, our company ran really well. I mean, I, I we did a good job. But now I'm in the opposite. Now I'm out, you know, in the open, scared to death about talking to people. Say something really stupid or something that's you know not politically correct and be slammed by it. So, but it's nervous for me. But it's good because the overall will be getting people like this young lady to go to college or to seek to find different passions and change their direction. This is the kinds of things that I want to do. And again, I, I appreciate that that target. If you don't mind me to add, even for older folks, because passions, you know, just awakening things that we don't think about. Right. You know, younger people, certainly, but older people, regardless, regardless of your age. I also Anybody look- in the transition, this is a worthwhile exercise uh, to just go through these these four P's and, and think about it. I want to talk a little bit more about them, the four P's. And I, I love how you have like the village of passions. And at the end, the key ideas and questions. 
uh, you have that, and it, which really I would hope when people read the book that you stop and think about those and answer those. And exactly, that's it. And, and by the way, for young people, answer those and then look at them every 12, 18, 15, 24 months and say, have yeah. they changed? Yeah. And I, I go through that in my, my speeches. My passions change significantly from high school. When you, you know, Tiger Woods had his passion at three years old and Ferdy didn't really get his passion until he was 80. But, you know, most people have to start their passion somewhere in their late teens. And, and I was baseball, basketball, math, science, and girls in, in, in high school. That sh morphed when I went to college. The girls stayed there, but you know, <laughs> the science and math morphed. I, I made a move toward right. physics that didn't work. And by the way, one of the things I tell kids, test. I tested physics, didn't work. I became an engineer. You know, baseball and basketball after my freshman year, I realized I wasn't going to be a professional athlete, moved into, you know, extracurricular activities. And one of my extracurricular activities, actually, I didn't realize at the time, but I really found my passion was I put 30 people together to create a magazine. I really enjoyed putting people together to basically solve a problem, create a product, start a program. And I got a kick out of the most, most excitement I had there. And I realized about 10 years later was I really enjoyed watching people and helping people do better than they thought they could. It was a real, I mean, it was a genius, basically. I, I got a kick up. And by people realized that I was really interested in them doing to exceeding their own expectations. And that carried me through most of my business career. People would say to me, you're really interested in me and me doing well. And I would never say that out loud, but it seemed like that was my passion. And, and then I yeah. developed another principle. That's why these things fit together. One of the principles I developed was you can create, you can basically accomplish almost anything if you don't care who gets the credit. And I carried that through. And then I, as I got older, I added to that principle. That's why I keep adding your principle. I added the principle of deflecting credit. Think about that. When someone says, Louis, you did a great job. You say, no, no, you know, the technician, Mary, she was the, she really made it happen. Three things, you get a trifecta, three things happen. You feel good. The person you talk to says, this guy is very special. And the person finds out you said that she did a good job. She feels good. And that's what I started doing is deflecting credit. And I found many really strong instances, uh, you know, when I finished certain jobs, I would, instead of, you know, you, know, you could give you a day when they, they praise you and so forth, I'd always make sure that I spread it around. And that was very important. So those are, that's, that's why these four P's, you keep moving, moving back and forth over them. They really help you. I've got to ask you where, and I've kind of alluded to this before, where do you think that comes from? You're very unique with some of your philosophies. Well, I, I, I'm not sure where... It, it the desire to help hard. others. It, it, it comes from hardship. I hate to say it. And, you know, that's why my, 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 it comes from hardship when you start to realize that it isn't all easy out there and there are people out there that have real difficulty and that you can help them. You see, I, this, these four parts of life, self, family, work, community. Community is giving back. And I tell you, there's a real response. A lot of people don't pay attention to that. And there's different parts of your life when you give back, but you get more satisfaction out of giving back. And maybe the reason we're put on the planet than anything else I've ever done. And once you get started into that, you know, you start to feel good about it. And it really, you know, it's, it's a positive thing. You don't have to be a big shot. You can, you can be in a soup kitchen two, day, two days a week and get a terrific amount of return out of that. So I, that's what basically, you know, having hardship. And that's why I say to people like myself today that are comfortable, take your children and make them uncomfortable. Send them to Outward Bound or Knowles National Leadership School or make them work in a, in a mental hospital or, or give them a difficulty. They give them difficulty because they, that's very, very important. That's wonderful. That's uh, wonderful. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking with Ed Hajim, H-A-J-I-M, Ed Hajim dot com is his website the island of the four p's a modern fable about preparing for your future and we can continue a little bit longer yeah, keep, keep going you're right great this is, uh, this is you ask very good questions you have good insights you. and that's you know that's what thank really counts and by the way one of the things that i'm getting out of all these interviews is i get questions that you know i have to think about answering and it's very healthy for me and i'm learning about myself i mean it sounds crazy at this age but i'm learning about myself you asked a very question where did that come from i'm going to contemplate that for probably the next well, few just, months and get a better answer 
Thank you. For, uh, you we're we're going to continue. We're going long today. You're listening to the We Be Free Radio Show, Brain from, from the Heartland, copyright Be Free Radio Limited, 2023, produced by the lovely Miss Bunny Face in cooperation with White Rabbit Productions. Okay, ID done. The w- the reason I was uh, asking is because there are people that have had hardships and for whatever reason, hardens them, lets them harden, they become successful, good for me. You just want to spread that and I, and help others. I just, that just is amazing. Absolutely, absolutely amazing. Well, thank you. It's wonderful. Oh, it's, it's a little bit selfish. I get a terrific return. I mean, I, I, I can quote chapter and verse. One of my scholarship students that stood up and she's a hundred pound young lady who's an optical engineering major and she's a concert pianist and a concert violinist. She stood up a few years back and said, if wasn't for you, Mr. Hagem, I wouldn't be here. Well, you know, come on. That's that's a heart pounder. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's that certainly is. That certainly yeah. is. I, and you I, get that. And which is wonderful. You're never going to hear from all the people. It also that, has, has I, opened up a whole new arena for me, which I never realized existed. There are organizations out there that deal with foster kids. There's a Wiley, I'm an honorary trustee of something called Wiley in Boston that has 75 students. And, in places like MIT and Harvard and, and Tufts and so forth. And they basically provide counselors for foster children. And these foster children must report or talk to a counselor at least once a week. And they had basically unbelievable success in graduation and so forth. And were vital during COVID. These people, had, kids had no place to go and why they placed them. So, you know, this, and, and the woman who runs it is a, a saint. So it was a, and I didn't even know about her before writing the book. She came across the book and called me up. <laughs> That's that's, that's absolutely absolutely wonderful, and I would urge people to also uh, your website. There's a lot of information on your website. Check out that gra- the gratitude uh, section on your website. It's just absolutely again absolutely beautiful. Let's. I would like to talk a little bit more about the principles. Again, we talked a bit about passion, and obviously, get the book, read the book. Uh, principles. Tell us a little bit more about principles, Ed. First of all, you start off with, I mean, if you're lucky like I am, you went to a Catholic school, you start off with the, the golden rule. The nuns taught me the golden rule with the golden ruler. They basically, you know, and they threw in the Ten Commandments, and they made it very clear to me that if you do the right things, you end up in the right place, and if you do the wrong things, you end up in the wrong place. And that lasted, you know, quite a while for me. You know, best I carried that through. But all through your life, you must develop, as I say, other principles which gov- govern your life. And I like, I, have, I just put some up on my wall, I put them in a book and I, I rec- and I also check those that they will change. And as I said, one of the ones that I came up with in my business career was, was if you don't worry about who gets the credit, you can accomplish almost anything. And I put that up on my wall and basically, you know, live by that. And I, I for example, and, and, and when I was at CE, really the managing partner of the, of the uh, investment bank for 20 years, I could have paid myself the most. I paid myself the most only one year out of those 20 years. That sent a message to everybody. So those are principles that you have. You know, my biggest principle today is, as you said, is, is gratitude. I mean, I really, that's thats my principle of life right now. And so I follow it. I said, what does gratitude mean? What do you do if you have gratitude? And you give back as much as you can. But you, I mean, principles, there are a lot of different principles. You know, early in my life, I had one is life is action and passion. If you don't take part in the action and passion of your life, you'll be judged not to have lived. That was good for you know a 26 or a 27 or 28 year old. Not so good today, <laughs> but you know. But but those are the kinds of things that you capture. And, and you know, it, it's it. You know, I had a book through them. I, I put them on my wall, and, and you know, I look at it, look up at them, and I'd say, make sure you're following that. And this business of of of, of deflecting credit was another principle. When I when I finished my last year at, at the University of Rochester, I wrote a letter to every one of 60 trustees and basically picked out something they had done during my term and thanked them for it. And I gave them a, a crystal. I think I still have it. I think I have it up in that second. I have a crystal. And it basically said their name, the University of Rochester, and thanks Ed on it. And I gave each one of them this crystal to sit on their desk. And I said, most thanks to thank yous disappear when they when people say them. This one will last forever. I so that was, you know, right. that, those are the kind of little little principles that you have in life. And and you know uh, you know, religion used to do it quite a bit. It, it, unfortunately, it's a little bit of a decline here in, in our particular era. Uh, it used to be, you know, there were very definite principles that you followed and, and it kept everybody kind of doing the right, right thing. But now I think each person has to have it and it's much more complex 
And it's much more sophisticated. Principles are something you really have to work on and live with. So that, that's been, my, and by the way, an interesting in the book, they argue about principles and passions, which comes first. That's a wonderful argument. And, the, the, and it's an argument, it's a conversation. You know, some people will put their principles first. And you also have the, uh, the, the principle number one is uh, treat others as you hope to be treated. And you're talking- The golden about rule. The, the golden you rule. Can almost, you know what, if you have that one, you almost got them all. <laughs> no, really. That's that's that, that's that's principle number one. It was beautiful in that. The uh, also on your website, the 2015 Horatio Alger Award winner, and there's a great uh, great video up there also. Tell us about the award and what that was like for you. Well, it, it was it was it was a you know it, it was the final un undressing. You know, it was basically forced me out in the open when I finally when they asked me to be uh, give me the award. They basically came in and said, we've got to find out everything about your life. And I was in the process of, of writing this, this book and I was struggling with it. But when they came to me and said, you've got to do it, I knew I had to do it. And uh, it was interesting, shocking in the front of, the, of my On the Road Less Travel book. I, I, before the award, I was getting very nervous about telling the world about my story because I I'd kept it a secret for 60 plus years. I went to the uh, Smithsonian Institute and I walked in the door with my wife and there on standing was a 1930-ish roadster, kind of the car my father kidnapped me in. And right behind it was a map. And the map went from St. Louis, on a big black line to Los Angeles. And of course I got a big flashback, but it was a great experience. Horatio Alger was, a, you know, there's only 700 Horatio Alger winners. And it requires someone who's had <coughs> a difficult background and who was successful in life and has given back. And of course, I kind of ticked those boxes, uh, but I, I, I wasn't sure that I wanted to do it because it requires you to be out in the open and, you know, tell your story. And, uh, you know, and by the way, I had trouble telling my story, but my daughter wrote the first draft of my childhood because I couldn't handle it. It was it was there was stuff in there that I I, I I used to well up and I couldn't I really couldn't do it. Now that I've been to this a couple of years now, I can I can deal with orphanages and foster homes and so forth. They, they aren't as difficult for me, but there was a real, you know, I buried this thing completely when I was 18 years old and never mentioned it to anyone. My wife didn't even know 100% of the story. So, you know, I had to bring it all back up again. And the psychologist would tell you, it's a terrible thing to do. Is that Well, to me, a little denial really helped me a lot because I didn't have to discuss this. You know, you, know you, you, you got, you know, I'm in an orphanage. What is an orphanage like? Well, that, that, that didn't come into my conversation and I could do other things. So I, today there's a more of a, a concept of hanging out, let it all hang out, but I really buried it. So bringing it back up wasn't so easy. Also in writing, I had to compare what I remembered with the facts. Luckily, my father had saved every letter that I wrote to him and I saved every letter that he wrote to me. And Barbara, my wife laid him out on, a, on the kitchen table and we went through it and got the facts. You know, that was very important. I thought I was in four foster homes. We got the letters out, it was five foster homes. So, you know, that kind of thing. When you say that about bearing uh, something, I, I understand a lot of people don't understand it unless you have and, and then had some recognition about that. I know personally, I'm not comparing the situations, but I had something I'd buried for years and uh, that's abuse, um, child abuse. And I'm glad I buried it at the time because yeah. it until I was, you know, a certain things started coming back up. And people that can't understand, and I, I will say this because I get, when I explain this, I get emails about, well, how could you, you can't bury, it's in your memory. Yes, but the way I always explain it, Ed, if you don't mind, just to tell you very quickly, the, if I went to, if my grandmother was alive and I went over and I was looking around or looking around the house and I'm up in the attic and I see some boxes in the corner of Lewis that, with my name on them and I look through and then all of a sudden I come on, I don't know why I use this example all the time, the Lemon Piper's Green Tambourine album. And what do I say? I forgot I had that album. And in that in that moment, I'm flooded. I'm singing the songs. I'm remembering it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, had, you had something that needed, uh, and not that the lemon pipers needed to go in a box, but to compare it, to give someone an idea of what it's like, and all of a sudden you're you're flooded with those those memories. And, and, but right. at the time, they were 
you're saying for you, better buried. And I know psychologists say that's not the thing to do. Maybe they haven't experienced it. Maybe they haven't didn't have a bad memory that or memories in your case, many that you had to bury. And then you dealt with it when you could. When you could, exactly. And I that, that that's I dealt with it when I could and when I was capable of dealing with it. And maybe someday you'll never be able to deal with it. It's better just getting rid of it. Because some of the horrible experiences that people have, they drag them out and it becomes part it becomes their life. I mean, if you can bury it, and you go on to making memories rather than living memories. You know? Yeah, I just, I, my thing is always you deal with it, whatever it is, or it will deal with you. And and again, in my case, I understand how it was dealing with me. Yeah. Uh, just didn't make the, the comparison, did the connection, if you will. So some people choose to live in the past and live in their past. I also didn't, I didn't want any benefits from my past. I didn't want people to do something for me that I didn't deserve. And that was very important to me. That was a really kind of, I don't know, I'm, again, I'm trying to figure out why I felt that way. So people use use their bad backgrounds as an advantage and get, you know, get something for it. But I, I really didn't want people to do something for me that I, did, I didn't deserve because I had some kind of problem in my background. So I, 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 I was, I, and I'm also, I was ashamed. I was ashamed of my yeah. background too. That was another thing that I find people, you know, let it all hang out, but you know, you, that's who you are. And I'm, and if I just I cut just cut it out, said this is who I am now, and off, I'm on my way. And after a while, it became a habit, so it was fine. And I didn't run across many people who knew that I was. But one young lady, and I hired her as a sales lady, knew it, but she never said anything, which was wonderful. So, you know, and people didn't know. You know, the, the University of Rochester didn't know it until Rachel Alger came, and then they all decided. And it was kind of fun coming out with it, and I'm ready for it now. I'm mean, I can handle it. I. I've, you know, I've gone through life enough and I'm successful enough and that I feel comfortable in letting people know. But then it, I wouldn't have been comfortable in those days. And I think each person has to make that decision. I give lecture to the racial algebra kids. I said, you have a decision now. You're leaving high school. You've been got a scholarship. You're going to college. You can let it hang out and recognize what that does for you, or you can bury it. And either way, you know, you live with either decision. And each person has to make their own decision. That's why this book, I think, I, the more I get excited about the book, it tells people that you're unique and you've got to make your own decisions about your passions and your principles and your partners and your plans. And, and that's why, you know, it doesn't tell you how to, what to do. It tells you how to do it. And the book of course is available everywhere and everywhere online. I, oh, know. let me just tell you the biggest plus. It's, it's now audible, six different voices, which is going to be fun. You can listen to it. Six different voices. Wow. Yeah. The gal, the Mary, Mary Withrich did a wonderful job. She got six different voices, an old voice, a young voice, you know, an English voice. And she, she, she really put it together. So it's really fun. It's two and a half hours of listening. You, you know, you, in a car trip, you'd be done in no time at all. So it's fun. I've, what is, what was it like for you when you first listened? What, you know, this is, oh, the, it, it was, well, I, I, you know, I, I, she wanted me to do more of it, but I, I it took me about two hours to do eight minutes. And so I decided I would, and also <laughs> actors, do, actors do a much better job. And, and the, first, the guy who, Bob Shapiro, who did my first book, really had my voice, which was great. But it, listening to it is great. It's a great experience. It's sort of, it's, it's almost an out of body experience when you, you hear you hear, yeah. you hear your book being read, read to you. But I, I'm an audible guy now. I'm at my age, you know, I love to walk. And when I walk, I listen. And I've listened to, I mean, I was an anti-fiction person. About three years ago, I got, hooked on fiction and I've read 120 times, listened to 120 titles in the last less than three years. But my listening to my own books is fun. It really is. It was by the way, the listening experience is almost a totally different experience than 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 uh, than uh, reading. In fact is when she did the book, she took out all of the questions and answers at the end of each chapter and put them at the very end because she wanted the the, the story to be read like a script, you know, like a like a story. Yeah. So don't don't interrupt the story. So it was kind of interesting. I, I like that with the, the Audible. I know a lot of people that uh, do Audible. I When I was on the road a lot younger, and this will date it, I had cassette tapes. Uh, cassette tapes? Cassette in the car, right? Tapes. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're all right. And now, and now with the access for to this, um, for people to be able to read with, or, or listen, I should say, on whatever their device is, at home, whatever. Or on Let me the, tell old people a trick, okay? I have hearing aids. <laughs> and you can walk with me. Nobody knows that you're listening to a book. It just it goes right into, into oh, your hearing. Really? <laughs> I did you know, that. Wow. It's, 
It's fabulous. I, I you just fabulous. thought you had headsets on. Or you something. take the phone, you put it in your pocket, and you turn it on, and you walk away. There's nothing. There's no thing hanging down. Nothing. It goes right into your into your ears. It's wonderful. Uh, that is that is that 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 is great. And I, like you said, you're hearing it had to be like an out of body experience hearing. But again, you talk point. about new jobs and new things. I think the hearing situation is going to change. These hearing aids are, are very expensive for anybody. And I think the whole hearing aid industry is going to change. Apple's going to come out with some kind of new hearing aid and or something like that. So just take any any technological situation. You're going to see enormous advances, you know, and uh, you know, and things like quantum computing. We haven't even started to see the change in the speed of things that are occurring. And again, there'll be negative and positive parts of this that have to be handled sociological. So there'll be a whole group of jobs to handle those things for society. So anyway, I don't want to get back no, on that. But that, no, it's, uh, it's great. I, I, I'm loving it. Yeah. It changed my, anyway, having these hearing aids is wonderful. But the, the phones go right into my ears. You know, these books go into my ears. It's just wonderful. And no, there's no noise, you know. That's a, that's a great way. Like you say, you're getting the exercises or you're getting the physical activity in. Yeah, you're right. I'm your, your list. Picking up your book. When you said that about fiction, I, I should be embarrassed to say this. I, years ago, when I first started, or, or my earlier in my radio days, that you know I, I was excited about nonfiction authors. I still am very excited. I still love reading nonfiction, primarily nonfiction. And then I remember a publicist asked me to do a uh, have a, a novelist on and i'm thinking i didn't say this out loud and it sounds terrible when i say it now so i'm gonna ask you tell me about the story you made up well i've learned over the years you know i, I, I like i say i should be embarrassed to say that out loud yet i learned they, they're creating worlds they're creating characters they're creating worlds it's it's obviously different that's why there's fiction and nonfiction. Yet it's amazing what you can do and what you can learn from fiction. So, so. I, I was I read I read no fiction because I thought that real world was actually much more you know interesting than, than Same fiction. With me. But I was wrong because fiction, you're right, they can create characters with different kinds of characteristics. They can interlace those people and you see things you don't see. I'm I'm sorry I didn't. My wife talked me into it. And uh, you know, Man from Moscow was the first book, and then I was hooked. Now I've read them all. I read all of Leon Uris, I mean, I'm the fit. Dan Silva. I, I, I'm working my way through Wilbur, Wilbur Smith now, and it, it's a, it's it's a wonderful thing, you know, and it's interesting as well. Uh, it, but I always felt that fiction was recreation, and I, I wasn't going to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I I, 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 I felt the same way. Uh, the Island of the Four Ps, a modern fable about preparing for your future, and Asian's new book, and on Audible also, which I think is, is very cool. You talk so beautifully about your wife. Do you mind sharing your love story? Oh, it's a great story. I mean, uh, this is, it's, I mean, it's a long story, unfortunately, and it, but it shows how it's up to you. you. <laughs> well, she, it, my, I, I, my humor magazine days, there was a, a, a junior, I was a senior, he was a junior and his name was David Melnick. And he basically uh, was going to take over from me as the editor. And so he invited me back to his house. And I was 21 and, and his 14 year old daughter, sister, was buzzing around us for three days. Well, we were three days while I was transferring all the information about the, you know, the job and so forth, what I, what I expected. And you know, each one of the characters, we had 30 different people working on. So forth. she was buzzing around, buzzing around. And she was a cute little girl. And I guess when I left, she told her mother she was going to marry me. And uh, <laughs> at, at 14. And so that wow. uh, it was sick. Six years later, I'm graduating from the from the uh, Harvard Business School, and I get a call from him from from David, and I said he wants me to be the best man in his wedding. <clears throat> so I get a call from David's mother saying, "Would I take little Barbara out to the wedding?" Sure, okay. So she shows up at at, at Idlewild, which is Kennedy, of course, and she passed me at least three times because she, you know, she's six. She's now a woman. She's not a girl anymore. Yeah. Anyway. So, so she, we went out to, we went to the wedding. She we had a good time together and so forth. And I basically flew out to the coast to visit a company that I had no interest in whatsoever. I just needed a ticket. I had no money. And he called me and said, you're the best man. I said, yes. I said, oh my God, I got no money. I went over to the placement office and I said to the guys, get me, a, get me anything. And I knew the gal there and she said, I'll find you something. And they found me something and company or mutual fund company. I wasn't interested at all. Anyway, uh, so after the wedding was over, I went down for my interview. I just wanted to get out of there. And 
felt sure enough, I fell in love with the company. They fell in love with me, and I spent 10 years there, 10 years of my life out there. And I went back to Harvard, and I thought she was kind of cute. So I called her, and I said, would you like to spend a weekend at Harvard? She said, yes, I'd love it. I said, okay, I'll fix you up with someone your own age. And I did. <laughs> oh, oh. No. Yeah, and? and then there was a weekend this later on in the, in the spring. I said to her, I said, well, you know, I haven't, I, I lost my date this week. And you want to come down? And so she came down. It was a fairly platonic weekend and we went back again. And uh, she had been coming out of teach. She was teaching. She had a teacher's degree and she was teaching in Connecticut. And I got a, I was going to get a job on Wall Street. And all of a sudden I changed my mind and took a job in this company in California, which and it's a great story why they why they hired me. But I could spend a minute on that. But anyway, so I went to California. She immediately quits her job, applies to the University of California, San Francisco for a master's degree and follows me out to California. And we started dating. And, and a year later, you know, I, I realized that this was an answer. So I always say I ran after her till she caught me. And it's been the greatest catch catcher that ever in the world. She changed my life so many times over. She, she's really my partner. She's made really key decisions in our life. Like I mean, when I went to Nantucket, built a beautiful house on the water. Everything was going great. And everybody in, in town loved me. They, I was a trustee and so forth. I was going to get into all the clubs. I got into none of the clubs for whatever reason. And I came back to the house and said, sell a house for out of here. I can't play golf on the island. There's no place to play golf. And she said, well, you built a golf course in Vail. Why don't you build one here? What do you mean build a golf course? There's no land. <laughs> I went out, found a piece of land, you know, called this guy from Vail. He came wow. out. We built, the golf course was named the number one golf course built in 1997, private amazing. golf course. Then we were, we were kind of persona non grata on the island because a bunch of rich guys, you know, because the club was hard, expensive to get into. Over this 25-year period, we've become the largest charity on the island. We're more than accepted by everybody. We send two kids to college every year. We contribute to 40 or 50 charities. And the big new crusade that I have is vocational education. And last year, we sent 10 kids to voc on vocational scholarships. So nurses, marine engineers, chefs. Look, at chef. One kid wanted to be a chef. Johnson Wells is $40,000 a year. We gave him a scholarship to go to Johnson Wells. And he spent the whole summer in our kitchen. And by the way, the biggest kick in my life, maybe of all, is after, I don't know if you're a golfer, but after nine holes, you usually go up and get an iced tea or a Coke or something. And when I go up to the Kelly and I said, Kelly, I, <clears throat> I like a, an iced tea. She says, what's your number? And I said, number one. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, that, that I have to say it gives it, it reverberates when you say that out loud, it reverberates through your body. So you're really number one, you know? And so I found the club and, and I, I, I mean, I didn't, the guy I've bailed did most of the work. I helped raise the money and so forth. But it was my idea. And, and uh, you know, I found a piece of land and it was a, they didn't want to sell it to us. The guy who owned it died. His children had needed the money. So we got, got this. A, I, I actually, if you're, if you're nice to me, I'll send you the book. It's a 25 year book anniversary book. It's a great story. A oh, great story. Yeah, absolutely. And with the, the, at what point did you know you wanted to marry her or ask oh, her? Uh, right. it, it just, you know, everything we, you know, we, we then, we didn't have a lot of you know, things in common, like she's artistic and I'm a scientific and, you know, I'm athletic and she's not athletic, but our values were so, so much the same. We, everything we talked about and we could talk for hours and she was just, a, and she also was, you know, she fit everything that I wanted in a woman. She was attractive and intelligent, you know, but interesting, but she also wanted to really raise a family and be a home, home person. In those days, you know, you had a division of labor. I was the hunter gatherer and she took care of the family. I brought my check home and I gave it to her and she took care of the, the household. And we, you know, that was the kind of thing I, and also her family was very warm. Her mother was a fantastic woman. So I, and I didn't have a family and she had a, a warm, wonderful family. Her brother was a friend of mine. Although when she told him she was going to marry me, he said, I don't think so. Not a good idea. He's kind of dark, you know, <laughs> at our 25th wedding anniversary, he admitted nope. that he was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it took him 25 years. Took him but, a you know, but, but, but he, he knew me really <laughs> well. He? And he, knew, he knew that I was angry and, you know, that I was, you know, he didn't know my background, but he knew that I would, there was something there that didn't, didn't fit together. So he told her not to do it. She did it anyway. But, he, and also I gave her a lot of credit for following me out there. She was gutsy. She knew what she wanted. And, yeah. you know, and so that's one part of life. If you find some partner who really understands you and, you know, will take you, 
you know, body and soul. And she, she knew some of the problems that were going to occur because we talked about it. I, I gave her a little bit of my background before we got, actually, a lot of my background before we got married. I wanted to understand that I had baggage. I mean, it, it was there. I didn't know how, what it was going to do to me, but, you know, so far, so good. <laughs> but, that's... but it was a great, great relationship. And, as, you know, and having worked for this company for 10 years, a wonderful company, I did very well there. I unfortunately left them, which was in the book. I should never have left them. They're a great company. But it was absolutely a lark going out to the wedding. I didn't even think about this company. So a lot of luck in life, too, and a lot of a lot of predetermination. You know, I was well, she always takes me to when she goes shopping, she takes me to the grocery store because I always find parking places. So I'm good for a lot of things. <laughs> oh, no, you really you go to this the parking lot's absolutely full and we're driving along and somebody pulls out in front of us all the time. She says, Oh, you did it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You guys are probably you two are probably a, are just a, a blast to be around. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking with Ed Hajim, Ed Hajim.com, E D H A J I M dot com, the island of the four Ps, a modern fable about preparing for your future and great gift for younger people uh, get to and gift yourself with one because again you and you talk about the plans i know i've I've kept you a long time just about the plans talk with us a little bit about the village of plants i, I want people to, to basically write down their plan where they want to go and how they expect to get there and while they're doing that take a look at history what i call context what what is going to be your lifetime that's why I, this First stop that the people make in plants, they sit in a little cylinder and they go through history, looking at the effect of what I call the four drivers. There, there are many more drivers, but drivers are government, you know, uh, geography, technology, you know, uh, the demographics, like demographics. Why am I so lucky? Why everything that I've bought in life has gone up in price? Because there are only 36 million of me and there are 78 million of baby boomers. They're right behind me. So whatever I bought, if they want it, there's more of them. You see? So demographics have a big effect. The government, obviously, when the government wants to do something, you can get involved in that. Technology changes the world. And then, you know, I, I, there's other things like geography. If you went to California in the, you know, after the war, you couldn't miss in real estate. So that's what I want people to understand their context. And so that write down where you want to go, I expect to get there and then try to find a wave or a cycle that you can follow and get, get the wind at your back. If you read biographies, people that are very successful, they have the wind at their back for at least a significant part of their life. 1983, I became the president and CEO of managing partner of a small brokerage firm. And over the next 20 years, we grew it 20 times or more, actually. All right. Great job, Ed. Huh? But during that period, the stock market went up 10 times. I had the wind at my back, you know, so any business you go into or lifestyle or, or location, like I'm in Florida now, I bought this place in 1988, piece of cake. I mean, I, did, I just did really well in 88, 89 and 90. I got this epiphany because the world the real estate market had crashed and I bought places all over the country, little, little places like a piece of land, condominium and so forth. Took I sold my, by the way, I sold my company on October the 1st, 1987, three weeks before the crash. And I had, first time in my life, I had some real money. So luck, a lot of luck. But having been in Florida at the right time, you know, 10 to 20 years ago, you almost can't miss. And if you stayed in, you know, upstate New York, you probably haven't done very well. So this is what I'm trying to get people to do. Think about where they're going to be, you know, what's going to happen in their lifetime. But, and the plans basically also write them down. I want people to write things down because thinking is very, very fuzzy. Speaking, you forgot what you said. When you write it down and look at it and say, hey, this is what I said. This is what I think. You can, you can change it. You can move on. But that's plans. And I, by the way, you get the four Ps right and you get the other, the other two Ps, which is you find your path and you find your purpose. And I think that's really my goals. Those are subtle. In there. They're, not, they're not mentioned, really. <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, you, you are... You are are fascinating. Again, the the book and to be able to listen to it in audio now, I, I just think that's great because the, the the physical book just came out on the fourth of this. The month. fourth of April, yeah, yeah, that's right. We've already sold. I think nothing... I've sold I've sold a couple thousand books already, which is kind of fun. I mean, I, I you know people are calling me up and they're, they're buying books. Uh, 
So it, 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 that, that, you know, I, I lose money on every book I sell. That's beside the point. Publishing business, I don't know about you, it's a terrible business. You don't know how many books you sell. You lose money on everything you sell. The, the publicist, you know, doubled my take on the second book. Was, he gave me $2,000 and he's only taking 80%. But he's done a brilliant job on this book. The illustrations are great. The, the paper is heavy. So, you know, again, in my earlier life, I would be, you know, complaining and bitching. And this is different. My, my game plan here is to different. produce a good product and the profitability is not important. I don't lose a lot of money, but, you know, it doesn't make any difference. What I'm trying to do is give this to somebody. One person said, this is really a table, a, a, a coffee table book. I, that gave me, you know, gave me pricklies. You know, gave me, gave me all, gave me all, that's wonderful. If this is something can become a classic. Then we can have some, have some real fun, you know. I'm actually looking at the idea of a, an animated film, or as I said to someone in, in humor, <laughs> how about a video game where nobody gets shot? <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that would be. But a a a um, that would be great if they do that. Would like, it be fun? Okay. I mean, I, well, I think about it. It's, it's what it's going to cost me. But an animated yeah. film might be good because there are enough characters in the in the book, as you can yeah. tell. That you can you can dress them up, and they're different and so forth. And in places, kind of an interesting island great. and so on. Yeah, could it's, be fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm visual. I've got a vision in my head a little bit about what that would be fantastic. That's yeah, it. Was you're, you're amazing. I've got to ask you uh, the dementia. You said you've got to find a, a I'll say a, a cure and or prevention. Are you optimistic about a dementia, a cure and or? Oh, yeah. I, I think you know, Rochester has got you know, a whole building full of people that are working on it, you know, just like smallpox or. You know, whatever they get, you spend enough money in something, you focus on it, you'll you'll get you'll get some kind of a cure. And I, there actually stuff happening right all right now that's slowing things down. I I have six friends, one two of which I've actually had eight, two of them have already died, but I have six friends now with various stages of dementia, and they're going through various you know experimental stuff and so forth. I think we'll cure it. We won't not cure it. We'll we'll slow it down. We'll we'll change it a bit and so forth. But we have done this. We we've cured. I mean. The flu could destroy the entire country without a flu shot. So, you know, we 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 will get there. It may Six. take a little longer, but we we well, have to concentrate the the research and spend money on it. But I see I see it happening, and I see the people that you know the things that are being done are very exciting. Wow, that's 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 uh, great to know. At least I, I hope you know. Again, I hope I I think <laughs> what I want is the young people that get excited about doing that. You know, dedicating their life to it, they'll get it done. Can I say? Um, can you consider me your friend? Because now you what? know you said you're six friends. I have six friends, okay. yeah. You've got seven now, me. <laughs> so thank you, sir. Yeah, thank you. thank you. No, I meant friends with that with dementia. When you're saying about you had six oh. friends that yeah. So yeah, and I, I I'm delighted to hear of your with your wisdom, with your experience, with your business knowledge. I'm delighted to hear. Ed Hagem, that you're optimistic about it for everyone that that suffers. It'll take time. Yeah, yeah. So again, I I love the book. I love the book. I see that you're never, uh, you're not one to sit and enjoy that time. That you're always working on something and always always doing something. I'm grateful that you shared the uh, your love story and how beautifully you write about your your wife and your family, and talked about America in your book, The Island of the Four Peas. I could talk with you for hours. Hopefully you'll do the gig with me again. I won't ask for a commitment, a modern so favor. Do me one favor, though. You please go to Amazon and give me a, a, a review and a rating. It takes two minutes or so. I appreciate it very much. Or anybody who does the book, I really appreciate it. They do that. It makes my publisher happy. And uh, one of these days, I hope the New York Times recognizes me. They haven't yet, so... I, I need a third party recommendation. AARP has picked up some some of it, but I, you, know, you, you need need you need you need you know reviews in order to get attention. So if you'll do that, thank you very much. Excellent, excellent. And again, the website is Ed Hajim E D H A J I M dot com. We've got links up. I had a blast with you. I hope I didn't keep you too long. Oh, no, you were great. You were great. We I, had a good time. I, yeah, really, really. The time went too quickly. I think. Look at Isn't my it? God. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my God. <laughs> 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 Agent, thank you so much. Go ahead. Tempest Fugit. My time flies. But anyway, thank you so much. For thank you. Your, your intention.
And thanks, Kim, our mute to Kim Weiss, our mutual friend. Thank you. Well, what an incredible guy he is, ladies and gentlemen. And I would urge you to get the book. I interesting for me in reading.